this afternoon as we endeavor to worship God in spirit and in truth. The elders a couple months ago asked me to preach on the second Sunday of every month in the afternoon, and I'm very thankful to have the opportunity to do so because it is something that I very much appreciate to do, love to do. I will say, though, in my mind, it's much easier than actually being obedient to the Word of God because that's where the hard part comes in. The preaching is uh, easier than it is than living it faithfully day by day. And that really, by the way, ties in with the lesson that I have for this afternoon because the title of the lesson this afternoon as I preach from God's Word is License to Sin. Kind of calls to my mind James Bond 007, License to Kill, right? <laughs> Well, this, the title of this lesson is License to Sin from God's Word. And one of the devil's biggest helpers in king, keeping men out of the kingdom of heaven is the false teaching that once I become a child of God, there is nothing I can do to lose my eternal salvation. It's the false doctrine of once saved, always saved. And in preaching God's Word this afternoon, that's what I've entitled this lesson is License to Sin because... This false doctrine is opposed to the call of God to live a separated, godly, holy life, a life that's pleasing to God in every way. It's really an insidious tool of the devil to make one comfortable in their sins, because that's what it does. It makes one comfortable in their sins and comfortable living like the world lives if once I obey the gospel and become a child of God, if once I'm saved through obedience to the gospel, if once saved, always saved were true, then I could just be comfortable living like the world lives and comfortable in my sins. But that is so far removed from what God's word teaches in uh, so many different verses. We're really just going to look at an isolated few, I say, in the sense that there's so many verses over and over that refute that false teaching. The clear, unmistakable truth that one become a child of God and subsequently live in such a way as to depart from the truth and lose his eternal salvation is spoken of in the scriptures so frequently that one could almost open up his Bible at random and be able to find a verse that refutes that damnable heresy on the page that he opens up at random. That's how numerous it is regarding the number of scriptures, the sheer number of scriptures that refute that false teaching. And so that's why I say this afternoon, for that reason, this, this lesson is really just the tip of the iceberg that sinks the Titanic. The Titanic being this mammoth false teaching known as once saved, always saved. In fact, as I go through the lesson, as I point to various verses in the Bible that address this particular topic, you're probably going to be thinking of 10 other verses for each verse that I point to this afternoon that goes along with the verse that I'm going to mention as I go through the lesson. So as we, as we uh, consider all that, let's, let's go ahead and begin to look at what the Bible says about this. We're going to start with 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 because here the Apostle Paul says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So only the faithful child of God, only the faithful child of God will inherit a home in heaven. There would be no need to take heed if the possibility of falling did not exist. And you know, one of the things you really see in that verse, as we're going to see in so many of the other verses that we're going to look at this afternoon, is diligent striving is always involved the scriptures that deal with the eternal security of the believer are always, always within the context of faithful obedience to God. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Hebrews 5 verse 9. And so as we go through these scriptures, we'll see that the false doctrine of once saved, always saved, is in direct opposition to the words of Jesus himself, who said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that, that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Matthew 7, 21. And we're all familiar with that verse. We all know that verse very well. 
But if you ever consider the fact that Jesus really right there in just one simple verse, Jesus refuted two false doctrines here. Number one, the false doctrine of faith only salvation. And number two, the false doctrine of once saved, always saved. One must do the will of the Father in order to be saved. And one must continue doing the will of the Father to be saved. Doeth notes continuous action. In a religious discussion I had with a friend recently, I asked the question, do you believe that one who believes in Jesus, obeys the gospel, becomes a child of God, and subsequently turns his back on God, becomes wicked, lives a sin-filled life, fails to repent, then dies, will be saved? Do you know what his answer was? His answer was yes. <laughs> Let me read the question again. I asked him, do you believe that one who believes in Jesus, obeys the gospel, becomes a child of God, and subsequently turns his back on God, becomes wicked, lives a sin-filled life, fails to repent, then dies, will be saved? He answered yes. But the emphatic point that we have from God's word is God's word says no, such a one will not be saved. To the Hebrew Christians, the writer says, the writer of the book of Hebrews says in Hebrews 3, verses 12 through 14, take heed, brethren. He's writing to Christian brethren. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you, Christian brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in doing what? In departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily what is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So to receive heaven's rest, we must remain true, faithful, steadfast to the end. And again, I take note of the fact that this is a verse among many that we're going to look at, of course, here written to Christian brethren, that the possibility exists of departing from the living God. And so we see that that possibility is ever present before us. We're exhorted, we're admonished, we're instructed to take heed lest we fall into that same trap, the snare of the devil. So to receive heaven's rest, we must remain true, faithful, steadfast to the end. The Holy Scriptures teach God's children can fall short of heaven's rest if they disobey and they fail to repent. The writer of the book of Hebrews says in the very next chapter, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Hebrews 4 verse 11. Now, the example he refers to is God's children when they came out of the land of Egypt who fell in the wilderness traveling to the promised land. For the Christian, the promised land is heaven. And if we, and we rather, have to remain faithful unto death, if we're going to obtain that promised land of heaven, just like when the Israelites came out of Egypt and they were traveling to that promised land and the majority fell in the wilderness because of their unfaithfulness. We Christians, if we do not continue in faithfulness, if we do not continue to remain faithful unto death, we will fall short of that promised land of heaven. You can't miss that point in what the writer of the book of Hebrews says there. Hebrews 4 verse 11. And so we have to remain faithful unto death in order to receive that promised land of heaven and when we sin, after we obey the gospel, when we sin, because we will sin, we must repent and confess of our sins to God in prayer in order to continue to have the blood of Christ wash away those sins. That's the very point of what the Apostle John's talking about when he writes that in 1 John 1, verses 7 through 9. The blood of Christ continues to wash away our sins if we repent of our sins and we confess those sins to God in prayer. 
And so the advocates of once saved, always saved, fail to recognize that the love of God, the love of God includes his goodness and his severity. That's what Paul wrote to the Roman Christians. In Romans 11, verse 22, Paul writes here, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Romans 11, 22. And so notice the analogy or notice the, uh, the example here that Paul's using when he speaks of those Jews. He says God's children, those fleshly Jews under the law of Moses, were cut off like a dead branch from an olive tree because of their unfaithfulness to God. So notice what Paul warns the Gentile Christians of. He warns them of the same fate if they become unfaithful and repent. Just like those Jews were cut off like a dead branch from an olive tree. Because of what? Because of their unfaithfulness to God, Paul warns the Gentile Christians of the same fate if they become unfaithful and fail to repent. You know, this this principle that we're speaking of here, you know, we find it over, over, over and over rather in the Old Testament as well. One of the verses I always think about in this regard is you remember when Judah was in its death throes, on the verge of its last captivity. You know, there were three carrying away to Babylon on the verge of that last and final captivity just before Jerusalem was annihilated and destroyed. We read in 2 Chronicles 36, verse 16, but they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy that's a very stark verse these are God's people we're talking about under the Old Testament the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy one of the lessons you can learn there is the fact that God's patience God's patience has an end It only lasts for so long. His people, his children, his people failed to obey him in this example. They reached a point where God's patience had reached its end because of his wrath till there was no remedy. That is a very stark verse. Calls to mind the verse that we just read earlier from Romans 11 verse 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. Now, one of the favorite verses of the proponents of once saved, always saved is found in John 10, verses 27 through 29. And this is what Jesus says here. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So notice that this promise of Jesus to give eternal life is only for his sheep. Now what's the definition of his sheep? Those who follow him. So what if we fail to follow him? What if we turn our back on Jesus? What if we fall into a wicked life and turn our back on God? Turn our back on Jesus. If we turn our back on Jesus and no longer follow him, we forfeit eternal life. That's what you see in that passage. They like to emphasize the fact that neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, but they fail to to notice what Jesus said in the very beginning of the verse. My sheep, his sheep, my sheep, Jesus says, hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So that assurance is within the context of those who follow Jesus, those who continue to follow Jesus unto the end. This is a God-given eternal principle. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. 
when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he hath trespassed and in his sin that he hath sinned in them shall he die. That's Ezekiel 18, verses 20 and 24. So the life of the Christian is likened to a marathon race. A marathon race. Only those who persevere and finish the race to its end will be saved. If we quit the race, give up, turn our back on God, fail to repent, and die in this condition, our hope of salvation will be lost forever. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Very familiar verses found in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. We all remember what Paul said at the very end of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Remember, he said, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 26 and 27. So there's a lot of things you can get from these verses, but notice that the Christian life involves diligent striving. Diligent striving, it's likened to a long distance race or a lengthy boxing match. If we turn our back on God, give up the fight, stop short of the finish line in the race, fail to keep the faith, we will lose the crown of life. We will lose our eternal salvation. Remember what Paul said in 2 Timothy 4 verses 7 and 8, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. So according to the damnable false doctrine of once saved, always saved, and listen, according to the damnable false doctrine of once saved, always saved, one can fail to fight the good fight, fail to finish the course, fail to keep the faith, and still receive the crown of righteousness, a direct contradiction to the clear, plain teaching of Scripture. You know, the proponents of this false doctrine greatly err because they think, they think, <laughs> diligent striving means earning salvation. Not so. The scriptures nowhere teach such. They fail to recognize that the grace of God, which brings salvation, is conditional upon our faithful obedience. That doesn't mean we earn it. It simply means it's conditional. <laughs> Titus 2, verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Ask yourself the question, what motivation does a person have? What motivation does a person have to be faithful to God if once saved, always saved? Not only do the scriptures refute such, it makes a mockery of what God plainly says. The false doctrine of once saved, always saved is nothing more than a license to sin for those who want to live worldly lives and still be recipients of the grace of God. That's what you see in that false teaching. 
in direct opposition to once saved, always saved, notice what Paul says, the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. My friend, in defense of his strong advocacy of once saved, always saved, asked me this question. If one of my own children were to depart from the family, would he cease being my child? I answered, of course not, but he is still responsible for his own conduct and can still lose his own salvation. That's the point of what the scriptures teach. God's children can lose their own salvation by their own disobedience, their own failure to repent. And so no matter how comforting this doctrine is to many, the Bible still says that Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5 verse 9. You know what their comfort ought to be in? Their comfort ought to be what the Bible teaches, that only the faithful Christian will be saved. The Christian has to run the race with endurance unto the end. The comfort of once saved, always saved, is simply a false comfort, a false hope. And that doctrine, that false doctrine of once saved, always saved, it is truly the quitter's creed. The quitter's creed. It's a doctrine that awards the prize, the crown of life, to the Christian who becomes unfaithful and wicked, turns his back on God, fails to repent, quits the race. And that's why I label it the quitter's creed. Because the child of God can lose his salvation. Listen again carefully to the words of the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Not once saved, always saved. Castaway. This is a child of God who fails to obtain heaven because he quit the race and quit the fight. Paul recognized he could be cast away if he failed to fight the good fight, failed to finish the race, and failed to keep the faith unto the end. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. So unlike once saved, always saved, Paul exhorted the disciples to do what? Continue in the faith, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Acts 14, verse 22. It's through much tribulation that a fighter fights the good fight. It's through much tribulation that a marathon runner finishes the race. It's through much tribulation that a Christian keeps the faith. It's through much tribulation that the Christian obtains heaven. Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite of once saved, always saved. Now, let's weigh this doctrine against the Scripture. I mean, we've already really been doing that, but I want to be real specific about using a couple of examples that Jesus gives us here in weighing this doctrine against the Scriptures. Kind of like you're weighing something in the balances, right? <laughs> so let's do that. Let's go to Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. We're not going to read the whole passage. I'm going to read part of it. But uh, we'll take a look at this as our first example when we weigh this doctrine against the Scripture. Because here in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, Jesus said, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Okay, notice, ten virgins, right? Ten virgins. Ten virgins. 
All servants. I want you to notice that. All of them were servants of the bridegroom. They took their lamps. They waited for the bridegroom's arrival. When the bridegroom arrived, five were wise being ready with oil for their lamps and went in with the bridegroom when the bridegroom arrived. Five were foolish, unprepared, having no oil for their lamps. When the bridegroom arrived, the five who were ready went in with the bridegroom and the door was shut. The five who were unprepared begged to be admitted but the bridegroom said, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye need watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Okay, so notice some important characteristics here in this parable that Jesus gives. The bridegroom is Christ. The ten virgins are all servants, every single one of them, servants of the bridegroom. The Lord will return at an hour that we do not expect. The five servants who were ready went in with him to the wedding. The five servants who were unprepared were not allowed to enter with the Lord to the wedding. So what's the purpose of the parable? The purpose of the parable is to always be ready for the Lord's return. That's the purpose of the parable. Verse 10, Matthew 25, verse 10. Because if he finds us unprepared when he returns, we will be castaways. That's what the Apostle Paul was talking about. We will be castaways forever separated from the Lord. Now note, according to the doctrine of once saved, always saved, there is no need to be ready for the Lord's return. And all ten servants will be admitted with the Lord to the wedding. That doctrine accuses our Lord of being a liar. That you see that here in this passage. Well, let's look at another example. Don't have to go very far because it's the very next parable that Jesus gives. It's right here in Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. For Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. He gave to each servant a servant. He gave to each servant a certain amount of money. Okay, talents here, we need to understand that talents is a measurement of weight applied to precious metals. So when you've got a, a certain number of talents, which is a weight of those precious metals, that translates into a certain amount of money that's been given to each man. Okay, so he gave, this master gave each servant a certain amount of money, talents, which is a measurement of weight applied to the precious metals. One servant, he gave five talents. One servant, he gave two talents. Another servant, one talent. Each according to his own ability. Okay, so take note in the parable. The five-talent man made five more. The two-talent man made two more. The one-talent man, the one-talent servant did nothing, hid his Lord's talent in the ground. And so when the Lord of these servants returned, the five-talent and the two-talent servants were commended for what? Commended for what? <laughs> they were commended for their faithfulness in using what they had been given. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. The one talent servant was told by the Lord that he was wicked, slothful, unprofitable, Matthew 25, verses 26 and 30. And the Lord commanded, And cast ye the unprofitable servant. This is a servant of the master. Cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, verse 30. And so let's review the parable. The Lord in the parable is Christ. The three men are all servants of the Lord. 
The three men are all his servants. Those who were faithful were told, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And the unfaithful one talent servant was cast into outer darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. A very sobering parable. And so when we weigh the doctrine of once saved, always saved, against this parable of our Lord that's been spoken here, according to the doctrine of once saved, always saved, the Lord will admit all three servants into his heavenly home, making the Lord a liar, 1 John 1, verse 10. And so the false doctrine of once saved, always saved is nothing more than a tool of the devil which serves as a license to sin. It makes those who profess Jesus as Lord comfortable in their sins. It removes the motivation to live pure, holy, and pleasing lives in the sight of God. It removes the necessity to repent and confess sin to God in prayer. And like the wicked Babylonian king Belshazzar, the false doctrine of once saved, always saved, has been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Daniel 5, verse 27. One must obey the gospel of Christ to be saved. And one must continue to be faithful to the gospel of Christ unto death. Therefore, we have to hear God's word, Romans 10, 17. We have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, who died for our sins, John 8, 24. We have to be willing to repent of our sins, to have that godly sorrow that produces a change of mind and a change of heart, because that's what repentance is, a change of mind and a change of heart, to do what God would have us to do, as opposed to the way that we were fall previously following to repent of our sins, Acts 17, verses 30 and 31, to confess Christ before men that he is the Son of God, Acts 8, verse 37, and to be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, Acts 8, verses 38 and 39, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, verse 16. And here's the point of the lesson. That having been done, the hard part just starts to be faithful unto death, Revelation 2, verse 10. To be faithful unto death. And for the one who has obeyed the gospel and subsequently departed from the faith, the plea, therefore, is to return and to be restored to the faith, James 5, verses 19 and 20. And so we see very clearly that there is a great day coming. And when death occurs and this life is over, we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. And so let us, let us be like the wise virgins in Matthew 25, verse 10, who were ready when the Lord returned, went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. These are the things we want to consider this afternoon as together we stand and sing.